The House will come to order. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction of first reading of House files 14 through 16. First reading, House files 14 through 16. The clerk will report House file number 6. House file number six, an act relating to transportation. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, Winkler moves that the rule therein be suspended and an urgency be declared and that the rules of the House be so far suspended so that House file number six be given its second, third readings and be placed upon its final passage. Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, members, this is the motion to allow us to take up the transportation bill tonight. I would ask Repres for a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I encourage uh, members to support the majority leader's uh, motion. Thank you. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, luckily, this bill does not contain the gas tax that I think uh, most Minnesotans were hoping uh, oh, that sorry. Republicans could kill, and luckily that position did prevail. Uh, so we would encourage folks to uh, su support this motion and take up the bill now. All those in favor of the Winkler motion, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The House, the clerk will give the bill its second reading. Second reading, House file number six. Second reading. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House file number six. Third reading. I recognize Representative Hornstein, a member from Hennepin, to explain your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, House File 6 is the transportation bill for uh, this biennium. And it is, uh, quite frankly, not the bill I hoped that we would bring out of uh, conference committee and uh, subsequent uh, conversations. Uh, we passed an excellent bill off the House floor, uh, a bill that contained uh, new revenue that met the needs of our state's uh, crumbling infrastructure and transportation and transit needs. And unfortunately, this bill uh, falls far short of meeting those needs. Uh, and quite frankly, it's very disappointing. Uh, and I consider it a missed opportunity. Uh, the uh, Senate did not uh, take up our, uh, our revenue raising uh, provisions. And therefore, I think we are uh, in a holding pattern in terms of new investment in transportation. And of course, that will uh, impact our economy impact our job situation, impact our commerce, our safety, and our mobility. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we did have uh, a good series of conference committee meetings uh, on some of the policy issues that are contained in this bill. Um, our conference committee met nine times, uh, and we had uh, two hearings on the particular bill that is before us. Uh, we had a budget hearing. Uh, on um, Wednesday, and we went over the policy provisions uh, yesterday in committee. So we had a total of four hours of vetting of this bill. Uh, I want to thank the uh, members of our committee uh, who have shown up. Uh, we, again, I think had excellent attendance at both of these hearings that we had, uh, which really, I think, reflects well on uh, our bipartisan uh, commitment to this issue. Uh, we had a fantastic conference committee, and I want to thank the conferees, uh, both sides of the aisle. We had the ranking member, uh, Representative Torkelson, on the conference committee, uh, Representative Richardson, uh, we had Representative Cagle, and Vice Chair Tabke, uh, all playing a very, very important role, all very engaged, all contributing uh, to the conversation. And like in every division, we have incredible staff. Um, uh, we had Andy Lee, our fiscal analyst, Matt Burris, uh, nonpartisan House Research. If you don't know them, get to know them. They are incredible. Uh, they stuck with us through many long and late hours. Uh, and of course, our, uh, our partisan staff on both sides of the aisle, again, incredible. Our committee administrator, uh, John Howe, uh, Joe Marble on the GOP side, uh, Jennifer Nelson, our researcher, and uh, Claire Stephen, the committee legislative assistant, all deserve incredible plaudits for their uh, fantastic work throughout the session. So members, I wanted to just uh, 
go over some of the uh, 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 important provisions that are in this bill. Uh, as I said, we had uh, many policy provisions, which I'll discuss. But first, I want to talk a little about the finance portions in this bill. Uh, we were given a uh, $97 million uh, target uh, in the general fund. And uh, the um, uh, global agreement really prescribed very specifically where just about all of that money would go. And it's primarily uh, divided into three pots. Uh, the largest is for the uh, MinLars replacement system. Uh, as you know, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission uh, appointed by the governor as a result of the March 5th legislation that this body passed uh, related to MinLars, and that Blue Ribbon Commission has recommended that we have a third-party uh, contractor uh, take over this uh, license and registration system. And that recommendation was made May 1st. So. There wasn't a lot of time uh, for the legislature to come up with a plan to implement uh, the recommendations, but uh, you will find uh, those recommendations contained in this bill in large part. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission was uh, headed up by Rick King from Thomson Reuters, who did an incredible job. Uh, he went above and beyond the call of duty working with the governor and legislative leaders uh, to come up with a plan to replace MinLars. And so we had a bipartisan bill introduced uh, last week. We had three Democrats and three Republicans from this body on that bill. It was heard on an informational basis, a joint House-Senate transportation hearing, and um, many of those provisions are contained in this bill. So that's, uh, that accounts for $56.7 million uh, of our general fund allocation. Uh, we also have $13 million for deputy registrars. As you uh, recall, we had uh, Representative Hansen uh, carry several bills on this topic uh, over the course of the session. Uh, we passed those bills here on the House floor, um, and uh, they are now contained in this final um, uh, bill with the Senate at a rate of $13 million. This is uh, reimbursements for deputy registrars who had uh, impacts to their businesses uh, as a result of the problems that we've experienced with MinLars over the years. So that is a, a reimbursement. We have a one-time $23 million uh, allocation to Metro Mobility. Uh, very, very important uh, for uh, people with disabilities to get around. And uh, this is uh, key to uh, the success of uh, transportation here in the metropolitan area. Uh, that is also from the general fund. Uh, we also uh, were able to extend Metro Mobility to Lakeville. Uh, we have uh, $1 million in uh, highway corridor and bridge improvement studies that many members uh, here had requested. Um, we allow data sharing between uh, DHS and Met Council uh, for that uh, Metro Mobility service. I think that's going to help uh, save several million dollars. Um, we have uh, the use of federal funds for active transportation. Uh, so that's in the bill. We have local airport zoning reforms, um, fee adjustments to help pay for the uh, DVS technology needs uh, for MinLARS and other uh, provisions. Uh, and um, uh, we also have uh, uh, the base funding for uh, MnDOT and the Met Council uh, contained in this bill. Um, and again, a number of policy provisions. I, I'm not going to go over all of them, but uh, I will I'll note some of the ones that I, uh, attracted the most attention. Uh, we um, uh, allow for uh, uh, voluntary and discrete autism and mental health identification, the driver's license. That was Representative Vogel's bill. Um, we require MnDOT to keep uh, an asset inventory. Uh, we have a uh, provision that allows for tribal governments to be eligible for public transit assistance, uh, an important provision for uh, the Department of Public Safety, wheelchair securement guidelines for transit and non-private transportation services. Um, we uh, uh, also uh, allow for um, uh, bond, uh, the transit bonding for the uh, Met Council. This is something that we do 
uh, on a uh, biennial basis. Sometimes this is carried in the transportation bill, sometimes in the tax bill. It's in the uh, transportation bill this year. Um, we uh, also uh, have uh, a number of turnbacks uh, that um, uh, are important to MnDOT and, um, you know, again, various other provisions uh, which we can discuss. But uh, members, again, uh, we have, again, quite a bit of, uh, of good policy in this bill. Uh, I was hoping that we could have uh, a lot more in terms of revenue. Uh, a couple of other disappointments uh, from our side of the aisle, and I think really for the state of Minnesota. Uh, we believe that it's very important for us to have uh, the driver's license uh, issue settled once and for all. Driver's licenses for aspiring citizens, uh, that is not in this bill. Uh, we did have some discussion in conference committee about it, uh, emphasizing to the Senate how um, uh, important it is for uh, uh, law enforcement to have this provision. Uh, we had, again, the multiple letters uh, from clergy, uh, as well as um, uh, many others that support uh, this legislation, and local officials, et cetera. So that was a big disappointment. Um, we uh, had hoped to have some dedicated funding for small cities. We had a provision for that. Uh, and hopefully, we have some new ideas that have emerged uh, that Representative Torkelson has talked about, and I hope we can revisit those uh, in the future. So that, again, that was a disappointment. Uh, our uh, committee spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, noting the connection between transportation and climate. As you know, uh, transportation is now the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in uh, the state, uh, eclipsing electric utilities, so we need to address this issue. Uh, we had some ideas to do that in this bill. Unfortunately, those uh, were not taken up uh, by the Senate. Um, so those are the, uh, again, some of the highlights and some of the disappointments. I'd be happy to, to uh, take questions and uh, look forward to your support of this legislation. Member discussion. Rep Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Hornstein, for your work uh, on this bill. Uh, also, uh, I want to make sure to give a special thanks to uh, Representative Torkelson, uh, as well as former Speaker Doubt. Uh, perhaps one of the most important things that's in this bill for road and bridge funding is what you're, it's not in the spreadsheets. And that is, with the changes that were made in statute last session, including this budget, there are almost $700 million in additional investments for road and bridges that come from the general fund proving that we do not need to raise taxes to invest heavily in our road and bridge. And this bill continues that policy. I also want to thank uh, member, the conferees for agreeing to privatize the Minlar's uh, traffic fiasco, the technology fiasco. That's a suggestion that was made uh, quite a while ago. And the fact that it's happening now is good news. And then last and finally, I want to th give a shout out to Chairman Howardstein on and all the conferees on behalf of the electric vehicle sub-caucus of the House of Representatives for defeating the Senate's proposals to raise uh, electric, fee, uh, electric vehicle fees. So thank you for your work on that. Uh, Madam Speaker and members, I have reviewed the bill and the spreadsheets. I can find not a single provision that members on this side of the aisle should be objecting to, and I would recommend an enthusiastic green vote for this transportation bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I almost agree with everything that uh, Representative Garofalo said. Uh, we both had electric vehicle uh, fee bills, but uh, mine was slightly higher, and I think that's the route uh, maybe we should revisit. But um, I just wanted to thank uh, Chair Hornstein and the committee for uh, their effort to work with them. I know I uh, beat up on the original bill before it came off the House floor uh, quite uh, beat up on it quite a bit, but uh, I appreciate that uh, we were finally able to include in this, and, and hopefully this uh, passes off the floor here, the data sharing that we worked on with the Met Council to try to save Metro Mobility um, some funds, um, and that leads into uh, my argument and my appreciation for finally allowing uh, service, Metro Mobility service, to the City of Lakeville, something that we've uh, worked on for quite a while and found a, a revenue stream that makes it justifiable. Um, the Richard Ames Memorial, uh, there's some family in Lakeville uh, to, that will appreciate that as well. Uh, Representative Albright's 
um, provision. Uh, I appreciate the flexibility of the conference committee to um, allow the slower moving vehicles, section 39, the slow poke provision to go in there. I think that will improve safety and I uh, appreciate that you put that in there. Um, and then as I mentioned, uh, section 112, uh, finally bringing an end to taxation without mobilization for the city of Lakeville. We will now be able to recognize and realize uh, Metro Mobility and Chair Hornstein. That means a lot uh, to me and to uh, people that testified like my friend Nick. Um, earlier today, a representative Hamilton had uh, um, invited us to use his wheelchair to go through the, the tunnel. It was fun to go down, but not a little bit of work uh, to come all the way back up. So uh, many people will benefit. Uh, people with disabilities will be able to have Metro Mobility in Lakeville, and uh, we'll be grateful for you, uh, Chair Hornstein, for that. So members, I encourage a green vote, and thank you for your work here, Chair Hornstein. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And just, uh, you know, just a word, to Representative Hornstein. Appreciate the work you did on the transportation bill, and just a bit of, you know, frustration. Um, you know, there's a lot of decent provisions uh, throughout the bill, but uh, just kind of in your heart of hearts, and to other members, I know you've heard it from members of both sides of the aisle, uh, an issue that really pertains to rural Minnesota, and that's uh, the ditch mowing moratorium. It was a bill that we brought forward, didn't get a hearing. Um, it passed in the Senate. Um, we were going to bring an amendment today, but. Uh, um, you know, as we move this forward, that's a, it's a big issue. And the members on the other side, we heard a lot of rhetoric uh, during the campaign talking about a one Minnesota and hearing the voices. Well, we understand where your majority is, folks. There are voices in rural Minnesota, whether it's Republican or Democrat, uh, that agree on this particular issue. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to hear those voices. And just because you may disagree and just because you may not live next to them uh, doesn't mean uh, it, what's going on in their backyard is not important. Uh, and those are provisions in state law that allow folks in the metro areas to mow without a, a permit. And uh, these are agreements, uh, nonverbal, and, and over many, many years uh, that have developed where rural landowners uh, maintain the ditches, clean the ditches uh, on their own dime, oftentimes repair the right of way when something happens um, out of their own dime because they're the ones driving the ditch and keeping them safe and making sure the person on the hay rack is safe. And so that's a large disappointment. I've heard that over and over. I'm sure most, some of the more rural members have heard that as well. Uh, but in, in, in mass, I think you have an okay bill here, and uh, I will be following uh, Chair Torkelson's uh, vote on it. Thank you. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm just wondering if uh, Chair Hornstein would yield for just a brief question. He will yield. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Chair Hornstein. My uh, notes here say that the, there's a provision in, uh, regarding the platooning of automated vehicles. And I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on what that is. My notes say that it's up to three vehicles. Uh, so does that include, uh, obviously it's commercial trucks, but does it include allowing for uh, tailgating and, and Stuff like that. Just if you could elaborate, just a few points on, on exactly what's being permitted. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, um, uh, Representative Lucero. Uh, this was um, a Senate provision, and I believe uh, supported by the truckers. Um, and uh, this comes out of I think some conversations that took place uh, with MnDOT. There was a task force on connected and automated vehicles. Uh, I don't know specifically the number of of trucks that are involved, um, and I will uh, be happy to locate that and find that in the bill and answer your question. Representative, okay. Representative, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Hornstein, I'd like to thank you personally for a project that's been in the House for a number of years. It's the Dennis Groth Memorial Bridge in Rosemount. As a Gold Star family member, I want to thank you personally and for this family that has been working on this project for years. Um, it really is going to mean a lot to them, and thank you very much. Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was wondering if uh, Representative Hornstein would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Miller. Madam Speaker, thank you. Representative Hornstein, I'm, I'm trying to pour through the spreadsheets. I admittedly so, maybe a little bit more last minute than I would have cared, but I'm not seeing something. And so if you, I think you can answer this pretty quickly. Um, if you were to break out um, 
small town funding under 5,000, towns under 5,000, uh, township roads, and county roads. Would you say that funding on those types of roads increase, decrease, or fundamentally stay the same in this biennium? Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and that's an important question. Uh, as we, uh, whether it's the, the type of roads that you're describing, or county roads, or state roads, Unfortunately, this is a status quo bill. So it's not decreasing, it's not increasing uh, at the rate we would like it. We had a very, very good, uh, for the first time, uh, dedicated funding stream for cities under 5,000. Uh, if we had done the revenue that was contained in the House version of this bill, uh, we would have seen an important increase in support for township roads, Again, the cities under 5,000 would have benefited. Uh, county roads, state roads, across the board, we would have seen a significant increase in resources. Some of the corridors that many people in this uh, body are very concerned about that have wanted to have funding over the years, those would have been funded in our bill. So unfortunately, this status quo bill uh, will not uh, significantly increase uh, road funding anywhere in the state. That's a huge disappointment. Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, members, uh, the challenge that I have is I, I represent a rural district, and I know that there's a balance that I represent my district, and I also represent the entire state, and I need to take any bill, especially a comprehensive omnibus bill like this, into consideration of the state. But my, but my first inclination is for my district and then districts that are like mine. And I can tell you that in rural Minnesota, when we talk about road improvements, it's entirely different than the suburbs. And I don't want to disrespect what the suburbs or the cities have, because they have very distinct needs also. But what happens in rural Minnesota is when we talk about the roads, yes, there are trunk highways out there. I have some of them that go through my district. But the far preponderance of them, the, the, the priority is, is the town of quantity anyway, township roads, not, not necessarily cost, but township roads, the small town roads is where we probably see, need, need to see the most improvements. And then when you talk about the roads that we travel from town to town, those are typically your two-lane blacktop uh, county roads. And so when we do this transportation, and believe me, Representative Hornstein, this has been a challenge since I've been here, and we were in the majority for a couple cycles with this. But it's very difficult for me to look at a transportation bill and say that we did it good or we did it bad when every time I have to go back to the people in my district and say, guess what, there's really no money for what we're doing out here. And the roads are degrading out there. There are some that are doing okay. There is some funding going out there. But I can tell you that when I talk to my local MnDOT people, or I talk to my counties especially, and then my small towns, I say, Representative Miller, when you guys talk about these funding increases, we're just frankly not seeing them out here. So members, I certainly hope that as we move forward, that uh, when we talk about one Minnesota, and we talk about transportation for one Minnesota, that we understand that there are transportation needs out there that I, in my opinion, are not seeing the focus that they should have, and I'm hoping to see that in the future. I'm kind of in the balance on this bill because I don't like that the money was taken away from um, the small towns, and although we may not have done it this body, the final bill has that, and I have to answer to my 26 small towns and explain to them why they're not getting the funding. And I'm done, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Plowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will uh, Representative Hornstein yield for a question, please? He will yield. Representative Plowski. Representative Hornstein, I'm looking at section 11 lines 2023 20, through lines 2030. The closing balance allocation on the disaster assistance contingency account. And I have, my first question is, how did it get in here? And my second question is, how does it work? And my third statement would be, if it doesn't work and people like this special session, we're about to get a few more during the interim. So if the representative would answer the first two. Representative Hornstein. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Representative Pulaski, <laughs> that was a question we asked as well. Um, we, it was uh, as part of the, the global agreement. Um, we were asked to carry this $20 million allocation. And the way it works is, I believe, the way that you had set it up. Um, I uh, strongly support how you have uh, uh, approached this issue, Representative Pulaski. Uh, and, um, you know, we were told to carry this in this bill, and that's why it's here. Representative Pulaski. Yeah, Madam Speaker and members, Representative Hornstein, so if I'm reading the language correctly, and these extra funds don't exist, 
There will be no funds in the disaster contingency account, and therefore the governor would have no choice in the case of a disaster to call a special session. Representative Hornstein, am I reading it the right way? Are you asking Representative Hornstein I'm asking yield? Representative Hornstein yield again. Yes, thank you, Ma'am Speaker. He will yield. Representative um, Hornstein. I uh, will get back to you on that, Representative Pulaski. Uh, this is, a, again, a new area for us here in, in transportation, and I will uh, have an answer for you shortly. Representative Pulaski. Well, Ma'am Speaker and members, it's not a new area for some of us. This fund was created so that we would not have to have a special session if there is a natural disaster. If these funds don't exist and we have a natural disaster declared either by the President of the United States or by the Governor and exceeds the funds that are currently in the account, there would be no choice but to have a special session. I know folks think that there's nothing special about a special session and you're enjoying this one immensely. Just think of a few more before February of 2020. Representative Moeller. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just wanted to thank Chair Hornstein and the committee members in the conferees for including what's called Mitchell's Law in this bill. Mitchell is a constituent of mine from Arden Hills who received a brain injury after a car crash. And after that crash happened, law enforcement and first responders didn't know who to contact to let the family members know of this life-threatening injury that Mitchell had. And so Mitchell um, had this idea, worked with the Brain Injury Alliance, and this provision will allow people when they apply for their driver's licenses to provide three emergency contacts in the event of emergency. And I think it's just a great idea, and I really want to thank all of you um, for supporting that. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm wondering if Representative Hornstein would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Hornstein, we've, we've gone through sort of an odd process uh, this session. Um, some have described it like a leadership tribunal. And I'm just wondering if you could let me know and let the body know which provisions uh, the conference committee actually completed, which provisions you and Chair of the Senate, uh, Senator Newman, decided, and which provisions were decided by the Leadership Tribunal. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative O'Neill. I wouldn't describe it as a tribunal at all. Um, it was a, uh, we had a couple of brief meetings uh, with leadership, and we did some problem solving, identifying different areas of disagreement, and, um, Senator Newman and I uh, uh, negotiated uh, this, all of this bill uh, in its entirety. There were a couple of uh, amendments we worked through with leadership at the end, uh, but uh, this was a House-Senate negotiation. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Hornstein yield? He will yield. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate uh, specifically on what the leadership, the tribunal decided, uh, because that was behind closed doors, none of the public got to hear that, the press was not included, and I'd really like to know what it was that happened in that room, and I think the public would like to know as well. Representative Hornstein. Again, uh, Madam Speaker, um, Representative O'Neill, it was not a tribunal. Let's uh, be very clear about that. That, that sounds uh, like a... Uh, a trial of sorts, uh, there was no trial involved here. Uh, we had um, a couple of uh, very brief meetings, I think that lasted each about 10 or 15 minutes, um, uh, just to explore some issues. Uh, I think at the very end, uh, uh, there were a couple of amendments that we uh, discussed and um, uh, adopted, and other than that, 99.9% .9 of this um, uh, Bill was uh, discussed over uh, uh, 14 hours of conference committee procedures. We had nine separate conference committees. We had two uh, meetings that took place uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, since this bill was passed, since this, or since this bill was uh, posted, uh, for a total of four hours. So uh, we did have a very public process here. Um, this was not a, a tribunal or trial at all. Um, and again, in the transportation arena, uh, there was a brief meeting uh, where a couple of uh, ish, you know, small issues were discussed. 
Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Chair Hornstein yield for one final question? He will yield. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm just wondering if you could let us know what those provisions were. Representative Hornstein. Uh, there was a discussion about um, an allocation for the uh, state road uh, uh, line item, and uh, that was not something that um, we were able to uh, adopt at this time. Uh, we also included, I believe, uh, some uh, language that the Senate wanted related to um, additional um, scrutiny of the Highway User Trust Distribution Fund. Representative Zerwas. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, members. Thank you, Representative Hornstein, uh, Chair Hornstein, for putting uh, this bill together. Members, I do have a great concern about one of the expenditures uh, within this bill. In this bill is a $650,000 study for the extension of the North Star commuter rail from my district, Big Lake, to St. Cloud. Members, I think I could save you $650,000 right now. If you look at the ridership on the North Star commuter rail, it has never, ever, ever hit its benchmark goal, ever. Right now, every rider on the North Star commuter rail going from Big Lake to downtown Minneapolis, each ride is subsidized $27 one way. That's $54 per workday round trip to Minneapolis. That's $270 a week per Rider, that is $1,080 a month per rider at $14,040 a year just in the operating expense subsidy per rider. Members, I would rather suggest that we lease every rider a Lexus and then crush it at the end of the year and lease them a new one. We'd save money. I've heard many, many arguments for the North Star commuter rail. I heard all about the economic development opportunities that would come along with the train. Members, I served on the Elk River City Council when this boondoggle came through, and they sold the Elk River City Council on the train. They sold the Big Lake City Council on the train. They sold the city of Ramsey on the train. They sold Anoka and Fridley on the train. And they talked about all the development that would come, the economic impact, the boom that would follow. It's the music man with the worst soundtrack. Members, I encourage you to take the train from Big Lake down to Minneapolis. Don't worry, don't worry. You don't have to buy your ticket in advance. It's empty. Just show up. There'll be plenty of room. So go ahead, hop on board and ride the train and look at the economic vitality and boom that comes with commuter rail and in Big Lake, you'll see empty fields where development was promised. But take it a little bit further. 
down Elk River. And you'll see, well, shoot, you'll see more empty fields around the train station. But don't worry, don't worry, you can take it to Ramsey. And in Ramsey, you'll see a parking garage, a couple city buildings, and a private development that went bankrupt and was bank owned. Whoops, the daisy. But take it to Anoka, and you'll see an empty parking lot and empty fields. Take it to Coon Rapids. Again, you will see no new development around the train. Friendly built a new bridge over a road, so I suppose you can count the pedestrian bridge. That's pretty cool. Members, this has been a boondoggle from day one. There is today a process to trigger this study. You might ask, well, if there's already a process to trigger this study, how come the study hasn't been triggered? Well, the study kicks in, members, when the ridership meets the appropriate threshold. And we're not even close. We're not even close. And so, before you tell me that there just isn't enough money to get our transportation priorities covered, and this is just a bare bones lights on bill. Well, I just found $650,000 you could have put to real use. Members, this provision in this bill is an embarrassment. There's money in the, in the provision. It says if there's money left over from the feasibility study, you can use it for pre-design and engineer work. Well, Chair Ornstein, I just saved you $650,000. You don't need to do this study, but I beg you, don't do the pre-design work, because it'll be a waste. Before I finish up, a quick extension and invitation. Members, during the interim, anybody that would like to come to Big Lake with me on any time to ride the train, you get a hold of me. We can pick whatever car we want to sit in. There will be plenty of room. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, um, members. Chair Hornstein. Uh, would the author yield for the uh, question, Madam Speaker? He will yield. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Chair Hornstein, did we... Uh, did we affect any of the, uh, I'm trying to look at the spreadsheet here, did we affect any of the motor vehicle uh, sales tax uh, dedication that was done in the last biennium? Was any of that backed out in the bill? Representative Hornstein. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Draskowski, there are no changes to uh, the allocation formula. Uh, that There were some changes when it came off the House floor, but uh, everything's status quo on that. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. Well, members, I do see, um, following up on Representative Miller's questions, uh, both the township road dollars and the small cities dollars have been zeroed out, but it appears that uh, transit has done very well. At least one category of transit in the bill has doubled in its allocation, but uh, township roads and small cities allocations are at zero in the bill. And I heard the discussion about, well, we just don't have enough money. Uh, there is a net increase, as I read it, of, of $84 million increase over the base in the bill in spending. On top of that, members, we're entering this next biennium with a $1 billion, arguably $1.5 billion surplus, a $2.5 billion uh, budget balance. Uh, that's sitting in the reserve account, and there's oodles of money here in state government 
and we're being told that we can't fund township roads in small cities in the bill because there's not enough money. As a matter of fact, members, there's 30 or I think it's $40 million of fee increases for Minnesotans in the bill, some of them dealing with many or maybe all of them dealing with the DVS area, the area that our constituents are tired of the behavior of government and failing them. So we're going to go back to the people of Minnesota and we're going to say, this government has failed you for the last three years and what we're going to do is put in the bill fee increases and we're going to nail you more. We're going to kick the people of Minnesota while they're already down in this bill in order to generate and squeeze more money out of them. And we don't have money for township roads in small cities in the bill. But we double transit. Members, please vote no. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would uh, Representative Pulowski yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Albright. Representative Pulowski, you and I have had long and storied uh, conversations about uh, disaster relief. I'm just wondering if you can recount for the members in this uh, body, how many special sessions have we convened that revolve around disaster relief in your uh, time served in this chamber? Representative Pulowski. Um, Madam Speaker, Representative Albright, too many, but I remember the last one in 2013. The last one in 2013 was unique because when the agreement was signed for the special session, and it was signed by the governor, it was signed by the leadership of the House and Senate, and in the first paragraph, the word appropriation was misspelled twice and then spelled three different ways. It's at that point that I made the statement, there is nothing special about a special session. And the problem with special sessions, particularly on the topic of disasters, is that we throw too much money in too many places for the wrong thing, and we don't end up addressing the disaster that is before us. We, we are doing what we think is the best, but frankly, we are not employing the best resources. So when Chapter 12B was created, and we created a disaster fund. It was to ensure that if the governor, with the advice and consent of the leadership of the House and Senate, saw a disaster and the governor declared it, the fund would then initiate support for that area of the state, and then, because we were not in session, literally we would pay the upfront costs and then a bill would be presented to the legislature when the legislature reconvened, as was done in 2014. If the transportation language fails to replenish the account and we would have a disaster called by the president or the governor, there would be no choice but to go back to what we did in 2013 and initiate a special session. I only hope we'd be able to spell the word appropriation this time. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would Representative Hornstein yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Albright. Representative Hornstein, uh, in your uh, response to Representative Pulowski's question about uh, how this account would be funded, and I believe in the language it says that it's only funded if there is an account surplus at the end of June. What would the balance of the disaster relief account B if that were to not occur? Representative Hornstein. So I wanted to clear, uh, I think these are good questions and um, I can answer uh, the initial, your question and uh, Representative Pulaski's question. So uh, first of all, the reason that it's in the transportation bill, it was in place there, uh, again is that this was a leadership decision. I was as surprised as anyone to see uh, uh, our um, uh, committee and our bill be the depository for uh, what amounts to uh, $20 million uh, that would be uh, transferred to the disaster assistance contingency account for future disasters because that account is running low. I don't have, uh, you're correct uh, that it is running low, I don't have the specific figure. So this would be after the 2019 session. Now. Um, one of the reasons it was put in the transportation bill, in my understanding, is because 
Uh, there are two contingent transfers already in this bill, and this is a third one. Uh, one, or this is the second one. Uh, one is for the disaster account, and the other is for Metro Mobility. So if there's not enough uh, extra money for both, the amount is reduced uh, to the extra that is available. So that is why we have this contingency uh, provision, and then we have the contingency provision for Metro Mobility. Uh, if uh, there is um, uh, money in the uh, 2019, February 2020 uh, forecast um, that is sufficient to fund Metro Mobility, they would get an additional $13 million on top of the one-time uh, $26 million that uh, they get in this bill, or $23 million that they get in this bill. So I want to emphasize this extra Metro Mobility, uh, do these dollars are one-time, one-time dollars, and then we have the contingency based on the forecast uh, in next February. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Hornstein, I think it's uh, very unfortunate that uh, the tribunal decided to put uh, these provisions in your bill. Unfortunately, we've abdicated the responsibility of both chambers to three people that have decided what the forecast is going to be for this state going forward. We can stand here and look at the forecast going out, but the one forecast that we cannot contemplate knowing from day to day is the weather. And the last time that I checked, most disasters don't come in small varieties. If you take a look at the first disaster that Representative Pulowski talks about, that was down in Freeborn County where a tornado came through and devastated a number of the townships down there. The next one happened in Duluth, ripped up roads, ripped up infrastructure. I had one in the Prior Lake Scott County area. These are not small, minimized issues. Most cost in excess of $50, $75 million. I'm having a conversation last night with my father-in-law, Paul Overgaard. Hey, Paul. He's watching now because he's concerned about what happens in this body with a lot of the provisions that are going on through this tribunal. He came from an era where the Senate did what it wanted to do, and the House did what it wanted to do, and they sent the bills to the governor, and they responded after the governor decided if he was going to sign them or not. Nowadays, we've relegated that to three people in a room under the dark of night. It's unconscionable. Representative Pulowski, I feel for the state of Minnesota if we don't get additional funding for disaster relief. Because it's going to happen, just like the weather happens every day. Whether it's a tornado, whether it's hail, whether it's flooding, or just recently, we heard about the avian outbreak. Representative Hornstein, this is not a place where we can play around with the numbers. Forecasts are forecasts. Usually, you're wrong. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Hornstein. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Let's correct the record here. Uh, this was, this contingent appropriation was part of the global agreement. It was never brought up in any of the discussions to help the House and Senate conferees move past uh, disagreements. Uh, this was in the global agreement 10 days ago. So let's be very, very clear about that. This was not part of uh, any kind of back and forth between the Senate. Uh, this was uh, part of the allocation that was given to this committee. So. Uh, I want I want the uh, body to understand the facts on that. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I wanted to express my appreciation to Representative Hornstein for including Section 13 of Article 3. Uh, this is something that's not been talked about at all. It's a bill that came to me that I gave to Representative Wolgamott, and 
what it honors uh, is a part of Interstate 94 from Sauk Center to Alexandria, where the two first MnDOT employees died 50 years ago in a tragic accident as uh, I-94 was being repaired. And uh, this accident occurred under the bridge at uh, West Union. Uh, the memorial uh, highway will be named the Kenneth E. Sellen and the Eugene B. Schlottfeldt Memorial Highway. Uh, and, and I think it was just so important that finally, uh, even after 50 years, we would recognize two employees at the Department of Transportation who gave their lives as they served uh, us uh, and, and some of you weren't even around then in 1968, but uh, it is important that we remember uh, that uh, our employees too who are out there working on our projects uh, or patrolling the uh, improvements on our interstates or other highways are recognized. And so I really appreciate uh, this recognition of these two gentlemen who have been so long deceased but who served us so well for our Department of Transportation. Thank you. Representative Wogelmont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if Representative Zerwas would yield for a question. I don't see. All right. I think Madam he's Speaker, making his way. It looks like we, he uh, will yield. While, while Representative Zerwas makes his way back to his desk, I want to thank uh, Chair Hornstein and the members of the Transportation Committee and uh, Representative Tama Tice, the co-author on my uh, efforts to get the funding for the uh, assessment and analysis and review of the North Star to St. Cloud study. Um, Madam Speaker, if Representative Zerwas would yield. He will yield. Representative Wolgamont. Madam Speaker, Representative Zerwas, what is the uh, uh, approximate population of Big Lake, the city that you represent? Representative Zerwas. Well, Madam Speaker, members, Representative Wolgamont, um, I represent Big Lake, Big Lake Township, Elk River, and a sliver of Otsego, like every member of this chamber, my population is between 35 and 40,000. Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and if Representative Zeros would yield for one more question. He will yield. Representative Wolgamont. Madam Speaker, Representative Zeros, how many uh, colleges and universities are in Big Lake? Representative Zerwas. <laughs> Madam Speaker, uh, members, uh, we have zero higher education institutions in the city of Big Lake uh, or Elk River. Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if Representative O'Driscoll would yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative O'Driscoll, um, it was really great serving on the Transportation Committee with you and uh, working together to advocate for the needs of Central Minnesota. Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, you're the senior member of our Central Minnesota delegation. I'm wondering if you could tell us what the population of the St. Cloud area is. Representative O'Driscoll. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Ogobot. I'm glad you said I'm the senior member, not the senior moment from our area. <laughs> there is a clear difference at this late hour of the, uh, the day in special session. Um, the mayor of the city of St. Cloud would like to tell everyone that the daytime population of the city of St. Cloud is 100,000. I dispute that number because that would mean that the city of Sauk Rapids, which I represent, that has about 15,000 people plus the city of Sartell, which has about 20,000 people, the city of Way Park, which has about 7,500 people, would all have to be empty during the daytime to be added to the 65,000 people of the city of St. Cloud. So I would say that the, the area population for central Minnesota is probably about 100,000. Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if Representative O'Driscoll would yield for one more question. He will yield. Representative Wolgamont. Madam Speaker, point of order. Representative Kosnick, state your point of order. Uh, in uh, Mason's 1.24, in a debate, a member must confine remarks to the question board for the House. And while I find the discussion on population of various cities quite interesting, um, you know, we've already gone in a special session because we couldn't get our work done. You know, I hope we're proud that we saved Pat 
Portorama, that we had all these other discussions and now here we are in special session because you couldn't manage your time. I think it'd be appropriate to uh, keep the discussion to the bill at hand to stop the persistent questioning of other members and put the, uh, put the bill to a vote. We are in discussion of House File Number 6 and all of its contents. Back to Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. Uh, the reason for my question is because uh, uh, a member of the body uh, questioned the need for the $650,000 that we have to, uh, to take a look at getting North Star 2 from Big Lake to St. Cloud. And it was mentioned that this was, uh, was not needed because there's not much ridership to Big Lake, so we don't need ridership to St. Cloud. Well, Madam Speaker and members, as we've heard, uh, Representative Zerwas, the number that we had from him for the population of Big Lake was about 40,000, I think is what he said. And uh, from Representative O'Driscoll, we heard a population of uh, over 100,000. And so, members, because St. Cloud is a regional center, because we have uh, four colleges and universities, College of St. Benedict, St. Cloud State, St. Cloud Tech, and St. John's University. Uh, this is a project that is supported by the local Chamber of Commerce because of what it's going to do to create jobs and support our businesses. So, uh, Madam Speaker and members, uh, thank you to Chair Hornstein for this funding and this bill. Thank you to Representative Tice for your efforts in advocating for this funding. This is a project that will make all of us in Minnesota more economically competitive. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Zerwas. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, Representative Volgamon, what's the population of Minneapolis? It's at the other, line, the other end of the line. It doesn't matter. They aren't hitting the projections. It's not, it's not working. Why is there this persistent need to pour good money after bad? Now I know in the lust to spend and tax and use as much taxpayer money as possible over on that side of the aisle, that it's hard to identify the potential that something perhaps isn't worth spending it on. But members, there, is, there are parameters already in place to trigger this study. The fact that this study hasn't happened is because the ridership numbers have never hit that point. And in fact, it's never come close. Representative Volgamon, there is a bus that goes to, from State Cloud to Big Lake for the train. It's called the North Star Lake. It's never, never hit its ridership projections. And so if your grand plan works, we'll take a cheap, easy to operate bus and mothball it. Extend a train line out for at least a billion dollars. And then where a half empty bus used to drive, you'll have a one quarter full train. And instead of $27 a trip subsidy, we'll be closer to $50 a trip subsidy. So I don't know if maybe your goal is to extend the train and then buy everyone a Maserati instead of a Lexus for riding the train. I cannot believe it. We were lectured to and lectured to about the need for a gas tax, a 70% increase in a gas tax. Meanwhile, $14,000 a year per rider wasted, wasted and the majority wants to extend it because putting that money down the toilet isn't enough. 
You have 100,000 people in the St. Cloud area. Representative Vogelbaum, if you'll yield for a question, out of the 100,000 people in the St. Cloud area, how many of them commute to Minneapolis on a daily basis? Representative Volkemont. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Zerwas, I don't have that specific number, but I do know that that is going to be one of the many variables that we take a look at with this appropriation so that we can get the information that we need to make good choices with taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Representative Zerwas. Madam Speaker, Representative Volkemont, how about we save $650,000? And I just tell you, not enough. Not enough to make it financially viable. I saved you six fifty. We just finished your study. You know what? How about next week, if we ever get done with this special session, come up to Big Lake, we'll have breakfast at Keys Cafe, and we'll go to the station. And we can watch the North Star Lake bus stop at the North Star Station. If a dozen people get off that first bus, I'll buy you your breakfast. $650,000 wasted. Representative Carlson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I find Representative Kosnick's point of order well taken, and I suggest we vote on the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, we've had a wide-ranging discussion uh, uh, regarding some of the details of this bill. Uh, let's get back to the bill itself. First, before I dive into that, I certainly want to thank uh, Chair Hornstein. Uh, he and I traded seats in the car or the bus or the train this year. Uh, he's now in the front seat. I'm in the back seat. We were reversed uh, in the last biennium. Uh, but, uh, while we have our differences about uh, transportation priorities and funding sources, uh, we both believe transportation is critical to the success of the state of Minnesota, and uh, his dedication to transportation is to be admired, and I, I'm happy to have the chance to work with him, even though, uh, of course, we sometimes have some differences once in a while. I'd also like to thank all the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle, and especially my staff, at Chelsea Axelson and Joe Marble, with whom I would not be able to function. You know, I've heard this uh, bill described as lights on and even described as paltry. Uh, this bill brings forward $6.7 billion in funding for transportation. Uh, it builds on the great success we had in 2000, 2017, and without the bill, uh, with the substantial bill we had in 2017, the lights in this bill are much brighter. Uh, we're doing good work here, folks, uh, and I have to, uh, from my perspective, be very happy about many of the things that are not in this bill. Uh, we heard a lot about a gas tax, it's been in the news, it's been talked about, and we found out just how much the citizens of Minnesota are not very much in favor of a gas tax, and it has disappeared, and I'm thankful for that. There are other ways that we were going to try to make Minnesota a much more expensive place to drive, including registration tax, a half-cent sales tax here in the metro area, and increased motor vehicle sales taxes. Those also are not in the bill. What is in the bill is substantial contribution from our general fund, uh, which I believe is appropriate. Transportation is important to every aspect of Minnesota and its economy. And to think that for some reason that the general fund should not be applied uh, to transportation, I believe, is inappropriate. And yet uh, that argument will continue into the future. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about uh, our small cities and our townships, which uh, did get left out of this bill, and I'm disappointed about that. I had an idea about how do we might be able to accomplish that, and I will pursue that idea into the future. Uh, we did retain, however, the local bridge fund. That is something uh, that I'm very proud of. Uh, we're going to send money to our local bridges on a predictable basis, 
and our county engineers will be very happy about that. Uh, I do have to talk a bit about Minlars. Uh, it's been, uh, I, I passed the, the millstone around my neck to Frank uh, when he got the chairmanship, but uh, it's been a burden for all of us. I'm thankful that the governor has hit this head on and is willing to address it. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of money, and it is a little bit alarming just how much money is involved in the fix of Minlars. It's too bad we didn't do it a lot sooner. Uh, we should have pulled the plug uh, more than a year ago when we realized how poorly it was operating. Uh, it's going to take $55 million in the general fund. It's going to take money out of the pockets of the citizens of Minnesota in the, in the form of higher fees, higher tech fees on their uh, work at the deputy registrar's office. And I'm also, uh, frankly, alarmed that uh, we have not really addressed the issue of proper compensation for our deputy registrars. There is the $13 million in here that will be distributed uh, to the deputy registrars, and members can see those amounts in the spreadsheet as to who gets what. Uh, but that really is looking backward to try and help recover some of the losses. Going forward, uh, we're adding a paltry $1 to the fee schedule for deputy registrars. It's frankly not enough. Uh, we, we are asking them to do much more work with this system. There's more data entry for every transaction. And if you're going to get a real ID, you have to bring in a series of documents to get it. And guess who's handling those documents? It's the deputy registrars. I hope we can continue to uh, talk about this issue and hopefully find a better way to address it in the future talked quite a bit about uh, contingencies uh, in this bill. Uh, the disaster relief is one, the uh, metro mobility is the other, but what we're doing there, folks, is we're spending money we don't have yet. Uh, we couldn't find enough money to spend in this budget, so we have to somehow reach out into the next budget and spend some more money that's uh, not even available yet. Uh, in my mind, not a very good way of budgeting. Uh, the other problem I really have is one of how we got the Minlars replacement bill in place. It really never had a proper hearing. It had an informational hearing, a joint hearing between the House and Senate. Uh, we didn't even get through all of the member questions. Uh, we had no testimony from interested parties, and there was no chance for any amendments. Uh, that was then rolled into this bill still without a proper hearing where we could actually dive into the details of the bill. Uh, while I support the effort to replace Minlars, it needs to be done. We should have done it in a more public, appropriate fashion where the bill could have been properly addressed in the committee process. All in all, this bill uh, does supply much needed funding to our transportation system. Uh, I believe it's got more good than bad. Uh, and I believe uh, I will be voting green, and I hope uh, others will vote green on this bill, too. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members, and thanks for the uh, good debate we had uh, today, as we did uh, at the end of April when the bill came off the House floor. I did want to answer Representative Lucero's question. I see he's not on the floor, but I will just say it is three vehicles as he uh, on the truck platooning, as he seemed to suggest. So three vehicles, and uh, wanted to make sure you had your question answered. Um, members, uh, I wanted to just respond to a couple of points that have been made. Um, when concerns were raised about small cities and uh, townships, we had generous funding for small cities and townships when this bill came off the House floor. We had generous funding for counties. We had generous funding for the state highway system. And so when people make these complaints that there's not enough resources, that just proves the point. It proves the point that we need more resources in order to uh, maintain our current system and expand it so that we have a first-rate road, bridge, and transit infrastructure in our state. And that is unfortunately what is lacking in this bill. I believe there was a compromise to be had. And perhaps that compromise 
also included some of Representative Torkelson's ideas in terms of using general fund money. Perhaps it included some of our ideas in terms of raising new revenue. Oftentimes, we do meet in the middle. Unfortunately, we did not. And the Senate Republicans insisted on this approach. They would not budge. They would not compromise. And hence, we have a bill that I believe is insufficient to meet our future needs. Members, these projects that we talk about, whether it's Highway 212, whether it's Highway 14, whether it's Highway 169, everybody has a project in their district. These projects don't go away, members, when we don't act, when we don't add revenue to the system. They get more expensive. So this status quo approach is actually fiscally irresponsible. We are going to approach a funding cliff in a couple years in our trunk highway bond uh, program. And unless we address that issue, we will be in even more dire straits than we are now. We were able to address that issue when this bill came off the House floor. And so I hope we will be able to reach a compromise this biennium. It's not out of uh, our reach. With efforts, we can do that. There are good ideas on both sides of the aisle. And uh, again, on transit, we uh, did not do the job. Uh, we have 720,000 more people coming in the next 20 years to the metro area. We need to make transit improvements. We need to do that urgently. There is bipartisan consensus, apparently, at least rhetorically, on the other side of the aisle that we invest in bus rapid transit. This status quo transit budget will not do that. I'm glad we have one-time money for Metro Mobility, and we have a separate line item for Metro Mobility. That's important. That's progress. But we need to make a lot more progress than that to build a first-rate public transportation system. So, members, while I am uh, pleased, again, that we have uh, some good provisions here, I know that we can do better than this. And I pledge to work with Representative Torkelson and uh, others who are very interested in transportation to see if we can come up with uh, at least some new revenue, one way or the other, uh, in this biennium, uh, because we don't do that in this bill. But nonetheless, uh, members, we have a lot of provisions from both sides of the aisle on the policy front that are good ones. I do support the North Star uh, provision. I think it's very important. Uh, we had a field hearing in St. Cloud that was attended by 250 people. We had at least 50 testifiers from the business community, from the faith community, uh, regular citizens of St. Cloud that are asking for this. This is simply a study. But I do believe uh, for the first time in a decade or more, we have a serious effort to get this uh, very important uh, commuter line uh, up to St. Cloud. That is critical. So members, I'm going to vote green. I encourage a green vote. Again, this is not the bill I would have liked to have seen, uh, but it is the bill before us. It uh, will fund uh, MnDOT. It will fund Met Council uh, at their base. Uh, that is critical uh, for our state to move forward. And uh, again, our new policy provisions, whether it's uh, uh, MinLARS, whether it's um, uh, the deputy registrars we have, I failed to mention, but I, I wanted to uh, uh, thank Representative Elkins for his efforts with the uh, uh, auto dealers provisions in this bill, as well as uh, allowing cities to uh, reduce speed limits. Um, I think those are very important uh, uh, policies as well that are in this bill. So members, I'm voting green. I would encourage a green vote. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 106 ayes and 19 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, DFL members, we will uh, caucus downstairs immediately upon recess. Representative Drzkowski. Well, Madam, thank you, Madam Speaker. We, uh, the House, New House Republican Caucus, will caucus in 111B downstairs. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Republicans will meet in our caucus room immediately upon recess. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, I move a recess to the call of the chair. Representative Winkler moves a recess to the call of the chair. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The House stands in recess. The motion prevails. <laughs>